In order to be a perfectly competitive market, the following five things must be true. We must have a large number of buyers and sellers. We must have perfect information, no transaction costs, the products must be homogenous, and there must be no significant barriers to entry or exit. So let's look at what each of these mean and the impact these have on the perfectly competitive market. So let's start first with the assumption that we have a large number of buyers and sellers. If you have a large number of buyers and sellers, so lots of people to buy the product from, lots of people to sell the product to, then we're assuming that they're acting independently of one another. In a perfectly competitive market, we're saying that each buyer is competing with the other buyers to get the product. We're fighting each other for it. And each seller is competing with the other businesses to get the customers. So if they're all truly acting independent of one another, then we have these individual demand curves and individual supply curves that are determining the price. Demand, supply, and then because of that, because we're all competing to be the buyer, competing to be the seller, it is supply and demand that determine the price and everyone is a price taker. Now in our previous video, we looked at how perfectly competitive markets, uh, we tend to use examples like commodities, okay? Well, the challenge with talking about a commodity as a perfectly competitive market is that the sellers in a lot of markets aren't acting independently, right? You might have a wheat board and the wheat board or the cheese board are a group of sellers that are working together. Well, why would these, these sellers group together to sell their product? Well, it comes back down to that discussion of market power, of influence over price. If we collectively get together to sell our cheese or our milk or our wheat, then we start to have more power and influence over the price. It's not us individually competing against each other, where then the price, remember the price, if we're all acting independently, this is the price that maximizes the deal to the customers and the deal to the business. If the buyers get together to negotiate or the sellers get together to negotiate, then they start to have more influence over the price and the customers can start taking up some of that producer surplus or the producers can start taking over some of that consumer surplus by manipulating the price. So in a perfectly competitive market, we're assuming that there's no groups of buyers and sellers, that everyone's competing against each other. And everyone is so small in terms of market share that they don't have power over the price. The price is set by supply and demand. Everyone's a price taker. Okay, the second assumption we have here is perfect information. This idea of perfect information means that all the buyers and sellers know what everyone else is paying or charging. So if we think about kind of that pit market demo that we did either in the face-to-face -face class where you bought and sold widgets and you had a black or a red colored card, or in the um, online class where I sent you information saying you were the buyer or the seller and here's the value or the cost of the product, in those demos, when we were trying to negotiate a price, you knew what everyone else was willing to pay, right? They were shouting it out in class or they were posting it in our Google Doc. You knew what the businesses were offering. They were shouting it out in class or they were posting it in the Google Doc. We had perfect information. And the reason perfect information is important is because as a customer, if you know what every business is charging, and the product is identical at every location, who do you buy from? You buy from whomever's the cheapest, okay? If you are a seller and you know what price all the customers are paying, then you know what you should charge because you know what the customers are gonna be willing to pay for it. And so that perfect information puts us back 
right here at this market price, maximizing consumer and producer surplus. So you know what everyone else is willing to pay, you know what everyone else is charging, and that influences the price that you're paying or charging. So we had large number of buyers and sellers, perfect information, and the third characteristic is what we call no transaction costs. The idea behind perfect information and no transaction costs is that there's no preference. You don't care who you buy from, you buy from whomever is the cheapest. In a perfectly competitive market, we are buying based on price, price alone. So it's really these, let's call them, let's two, three, and four that are creating that no preference. So first, first you have to know what everyone else is charging so you can buy from whomever's cheapest. The next is we have to have no transaction costs. So what does that mean? We talk about no transaction costs. We're talking about the extra cost to buy from a particular company. So no transaction cost means there's no extra cost to buy from one company versus another. Okay, you're gonna buy bread. You can buy from Safeway or Save-On or Co-op. If there is no transaction cost, this would assume that Safeway, Save-On and Co-op are exactly the same distance from your house. If not, if you have to drive twice as far to get to Safeway, then there's now an extra cost to buy from Safeway besides the price of the bread. That extra gas, that extra time. So transaction costs are the extra cost to buy, um, what did I write here? To buy from a, <laughs> let's try that again. To buy from a business, extra cost to buy from a particular, I just wrote the words twice. Extra cost to buy from a particular company. So, do businesses wanna have no transaction costs? Do they want you to only consider the price of bread when you buy from them? Oh, well, no, they want customer loyalty. They want you to demand their company and only their company and keep coming back. So businesses actually put in transaction costs when they are the negative version of transaction costs when they're trying to entice you. So for example, why is there uh, a Costco card? Why do you earn air miles when you buy from Safeway? Why do you get a check to, as a member of the co-op? Well, if you earn points that gets you free things or lowers the cost, then you're no longer considering just the price of the bread between Safeway and Save On and co-op. You're now thinking, oh, if I shop at Safeway, I earn air miles, those are my points, and then I get free stuff. So now when I'm comparing the price of bread at Safeway, Save-On, and Co-op, I might be willing to pay a little bit more for bread at Safeway because it also gets me air miles. Or I might be willing to buy, you know, from a particular place because it earns me discounts on gas. These things are influencing our decisions. In a perfectly competitive market, you have no preference. You only buy from whomever's the cheapest. So we're assuming no transaction costs, no additional costs, and the reverse of that benefits, of buying from one company versus another. You show no preference. The last piece here, to create no preference and buy from whomever is the cheapest is for the products to be the same. So that would mean the bread at Safeway and Co-op and Save-On have to be the same Dempster's wheat bread at all three locations, same level of freshness, so that there's no difference in the quality or the product itself that would cause you to prefer one company or the other. So we need these characteristics to be true in order for the perfectly competitive market to have a price 
that is set by supply and demand. Everyone's a price taker and a price that maximizes the deal to the business and the customers equally. If we start to show preference, that creates market power to the seller and so will then influence price. In a perfectly competitive market, we show no preference. We have lots of choices. We buy from whomever's the cheapest. The last characteristic that we need to be present is that there needs to be no significant barriers to entry or exit. What we mean by no significant barriers to entry or exit is that existing firms, companies that are already in business, do not have an advantage over new ones. So anybody who wants can join in. That, mean, that doesn't mean there's no cost to start the business. It just means that it is not so expensive. We don't have these exorbitant entry fees. It's not so costly to start the, a business that it keeps out the competition. In a perfectly competitive market, there are lots of sellers. And so when you see others making profit in this industry, you jump in. Okay. So what this allows for is lots of sellers when there's money to be made and less sellers when there's not. And it means that all the businesses, the new ones and the existing ones, there's no advantage for one or the other. Remember, in a perfectly competitive market, there's no preference. Well, in order for there to be no preference and us to buy from whomever is the cheapest, that means that all the businesses need to kind of be operating under the same cost structure. So it can't be that there's a huge advantage to be an old established company versus a new startup. So that means that companies like, that sell like liquid nitrogen, for example, where they need government certification um, approval to be in business, can't be perfectly competitive markets. There is a barrier to entry. That's the inspections, the audits, the certification from the government, okay? Perfectly competitive markets need to be ones where the cost to start up and the permissions to do so are not so huge to keep people out. This would be kind of like the equivalent of, well, if you see a bunch of canola farmers uh, making tons of profit, then what do you do? You take your backyard and you start growing canola in your backyard. You join in. And uh, if you're not making money, you can get out. These assumptions here about being able to enter and exit the market have a big impact on where the price ends up in a perfectly competitive market. And we're gonna look at that in the next video. But what we need to take away today is that in order to have a perfectly competitive market, we must have a large number of buyers and sellers. In order for there to be no preference and buy from whomever is cheapest, we must have perfect information so we know what everyone else is paying and charging. There's no transaction cost, so there's no additional cost to buy from one business versus another. And the products are the same. So we don't care whom we buy from, we buy from whomever's the cheapest. And lastly, we need to have no significant barriers to entry or exit. Businesses can join in, businesses can leave. And that last one we'll look at in more detail in our next video.